Here's a version, my version of the assignment tracker program that you wrote last semester. We get to add things, add classes, okay, assignment description, whatever. Save it, complete it. A little bit of validation. What's wrong with this app? Doesn't save. That's not real convenient. Got to leave this running on my laptop forever if I want to use it. That's its biggest problem right now is it doesn't save. What else? I can't pick dates that are any further than a couple of weeks into the future, but that was the assignment requirements at the time. <clears throat> I think many of you put validation in here, so if you pick something that's not on the list, you get an error. So you have to select from the list. So there's some validation going on here. But what happens if I leave this blank? Some of you put the validation in for that as well. Some of you didn't. It was extra credit. So if I try to save this now, get another error marker. Okay, and you're going to learn about these error markers in this unit or in the next unit. There's a lab to teach you how to make these things show up if you didn't do that. Okay, and with the date, because this is a combo box, there's no way to pick it in the future. But this program's biggest problem is the fact that it can't save. Now we could jump right into databases, but this would be a pretty simple database application because there's really only field, three fields to save for every assignment. Uh, make that four. The fourth field is, is it complete or isn't it? We could do this with a database. What we're going to do instead is learn how to save to a text file. So I just want to demonstrate kind of where we're going. We're going to use this basic text file processing program that's going to allow us to successfully read and then save to a text file. So let's take a look at the notes. Why text files? Text files are the most portable way to save to transfer data from one location to another. When I run my assignment tracker, I don't like typing all your, not my assignment tracker, excuse me, if I have my attendance tracker, I don't like and I don't want to type all your names in. And I don't want to register each one of you in this class and then in the systems class and then in the RDD class and then have to do, I don't want to do that. So what I have done is found a way to copy my Blackboard page. It's got all your names in there. It's got the course name in it. It's got the semester in it. It's got all the stuff I need. Copy that to a text file and then read it and process it using Visual Studio to suck that information in. It's a good way. Text files are the most convenient way to transfer data from one program to another. So having the ability to read them and process the strings that might be in them is a very, very valuable skill. A lot of stuff is already out there in text format. <laughs> the Windows registry is nothing but a text file. So you could write your own Visual Studio project to analyze the Windows registry if you can find your way through it. And write your own registry cleaners or your own registry snoopers or whatever you want to write. Many databases have an export to text feature. In your beginning Access or Microsoft Office class, you will learn how to export from Access. Now, one of the things you could export to is a text file. It takes your database, its structure, its data, saves it as a text file that you could then read into a C Sharp program. XML files, extensible markup language, is what that stands for. Uh, it's been around for quite a while now. Its primary purpose is to store the structure of a database in a text format so that we can share them. In my case, the last time I used an XML file, uh, I have a website that stores all the books that I've read. But I, want, I wrote an Android app and I wanted to transfer that data from up down into my app. The only way to share that data, because they use different database feature programs, is to convert it to an XML file on one and then read it back in as an XML file on the other and convert it back into a different kind of database. Many programs have XML programming features built right into them. 
we're not going to investigate at here, but that's just another option that may come into your path when you do the mobile class. So common uses for data import. We use some kind of a delimiter, text delimited files. Delimited means separated. If I took Aaron's name and tacked it on to John and tacked that on to Kevin and just smooshed them together, how would I know where one name ends and another one starts? I wouldn't. Unless I put a space in between, but that's no good because we might have a Mary Jo in the class with a space. Now that space is going to mess things up. So we need some kind of special character to delimit our data so we can tell one piece of data from another. <clears throat> Typically, that's a comma. Most programs allow you to create comma delimited files. And then you have to write the code that says, okay, keep reading until you hit a comma. Now stop. That's the first field. Keep reading until you hit a comma. Stop. That's the last name. Keep reading until you hit a comma. Very common <clears throat> processing that we'll take a look at. So we can create comma delimited files. You don't have to delimit using commas. You, we're going to delimit actually in our assignment tracker with something else. But if you can delimit with commas, you can delimit with double equal signs. You can delimit with slashes. You can delimit with anything. Processing is very much the same. File processing basics. All right, here's our program that we're going to be using. It's just a simple little program. That's not what I wanted to do. It's going to show us the contents of the file into a text box. So we're going to read a file. It's out there on our system someplace. We're going to read it in, display its contents in this window. But that's a text box window, so ultimately we'll also be able to edit it, change it, and then save it back out again. So we'll be able to open it and save it. Once we know how to do that, then we have the task of manipulating that text and reading it, putting it in separate lines, doing whatever we need to do with it. But our first goal is to be able to get text from a file into our program and then back out again. C Sharp, like many other programs, treats its text files as streams of text, meaning Imagine the New York City big building, I don't even know what the building's name is, it sits in the corner and there's always this kind of a ticker tape going by that has news highlights and stock prices and it just keeps streaming by one character at a time. It's kind of the way most programming languages treat their text files, it's just a big long stream of characters. Well, what about carriage returns and commas and things? Well, remember a carriage return we learned last semester it's nothing but a character. It's a special character. So you and I see multiple lines of text, and we'll display them that way in our text box, but the program itself still sees a stream of characters. When we use a text file, we have to follow four steps. First of all, we have to create a variable. So there it is. There's my text file. Not only that, but that pointer points to the file but it also keeps track of where am I in that stream of text. Right. So that pointer walks down the file. So initially we create the pointer, then we open the file. Whenever you open the file, that pointer typically goes to the very first character in the file. So, okay, I'm ready. Let's start reading. doesn't have to. We can tell it to go right to the end because I want to add new stuff to the end. But typically you do one or the other to a text file. You either read from it or you write to it. It's very difficult to do both at the same time. So we're not going to. We're going to read what's in the file, its entirety, all of it, put it in this text box. Let the user manipulate it. And when they hit save, we're going to take that entire text box contents and overwrite <coughs> what's out in that text file. Reading and writing from the same file at the same time is very difficult. We're not going to do that. So we open that file. We process it, which means read it, either one character, more typically one line at a time. Even though it's a stream of text, C Sharp has built-in methods that read until it hits a carriage return, which is basically a line. It <coughs> reads an entire line at once. It's often what we do. It's pretty rare to process one character at a time. 
even with my assignment tracker program or my, my attendance program, I read an entire line and then I analyze that line. I don't read one character at a time. Once we're done, this is a step that many people forget. It's very important that you close a file. Your program is now communicating with the Windows operating system because Windows is the one who's responsible for all the files, right? Where are they? Which ones are being used? Where are they located? Are they open? Are they busy? When we open the file, we're basically telling Windows, that file right there, I want access to it, open it up, sign it to me so nobody else can mess with it. If you forget to close it, it could stay open and other people could be locked. Have you ever had that happen with access? You open it and then you forget and you shut down and the next time you come in, there's this little hidden LDB lock file. It's a locked database file. It's left over. Should have been cleaned up. Our programs are always going to close. Turns out, if your program ends and it hasn't closed its files, Windows goes, hey, you forgot to clean this up, and it cleans it up for you. If you're reading from it, if you're writing from it, or writing to it, excuse me, there's a nasty side effect that we'll talk about a little bit later in the notes. You must close files when you write them. It is considered poor programming style not to close your files when you read from them. So you will always close the file. It's kind of like curly brackets. Whenever I open a file, I immediately type the close command, then I stick stuff in between so I don't forget. Visual Studio has a special class called System I.O. built into the language. I.O. for? What does it stand for? Input output. So this is a class whose job it is to do input output. One of the things it knows how to do is read from a text file. It also knows how to read other kinds of files, like binary files. That's another thing that we're not getting into here, reading binary files, ones and zeros, and trying to analyze what the heck those are. That's a whole different process. I haven't done that in years. I haven't needed to. Okay. So if we're going to do file reading, it's advantageous for us to add a system I.O. using command to the top of our text. So I'm going to the text of my form here. And here's a bunch of using commands. And I discovered, by the way, this is a little sidelight. Somewhere in here I discovered maybe it was a tool that says remove all the unused imports. I found that someplace. I forget. Maybe it's in the right click. If I find it again, I'll let you know. But there was a way to actually remove the ones you're not using. But we need a new one. So I'm just going to copy, copy the example of the ones already there. And then my notes say it's system.io, semicolon. You don't need to put that in, but it shortens all the rest of our commands. If you don't put that in, then all the other commands get longer. <laughs> so if you, that's only necessary if you're doing text processing. <coughs> So the next thing I want to do is read from a file. Is that really what I want to do first? I think so. We'll just, we'll just create a text file using Notepad or something, put some stuff in it, and then try to read it. So the first thing I need is this pointer. Remember there were four steps. Create the pointer, open the file, process it, and then don't forget to close it. So we've got to define a pointer. When we're reading from a file, we want our pointer to be of type Screen reader. That's a type? Well, sort of. It's a class that comes inside the using system I.O. file. If I hadn't done the using system I.O., I couldn't just say stream reader. I'd have to say system.io.streamreader. Makes it harder to read and harder to type, and you have to just keep doing that system.io over and over and over again. By putting it up here in the using command, that tells C sharp that expect some I.O. commands and just assume that the system I.O. is in front of it. So where do we do this? Well, right now I'm reading from a file. So that's probably going to happen when I click the open button. So here's my open code. This method reads the contents of the text file and displays it on the form in that text box. So in here I now want to define that stream reader variable. Notice the stream reader and stream writer are now available. They weren't there before. 
they're there because of my using system IO. So if you're writing these programs and IntelliSense doesn't give you those choices, you missed a step. Stream reader, and then you can call it whatever you want. Um, I usually prefix them by my input pointer variables with an in to tell me that this is a pointer to an input file. I mentioned earlier that it's rare that you read and write from the same file, but it's not uncommon that you read from one file and then write to another. <coughs> so you can read and write at the same time. It's usually not the same file, too. Usually it's two files. So I prefix it with an in to remind myself that this is my in pointer, and often I'll just stick the word file on there. Reading from a file. If you wish, if it's a certain kind of file, like assignments, you could call it in assignments. In students, whatever's in that file. In this case, it's pretty generic, so I'm going to keep it a generic name. And this is my pointer to the input file. I still require in this class that you document all your methods, that you document all your variables. Methods must still be complete sentences because many of you still need practice. Some of you still have not installed the spell checker, I swear, in Visual Studio. Right, Rachel showed us how last semester programming logic, she even made a recording. If you haven't installed the spell checker into your version of Visual Studio, go get it. Those of you who just copied brand new virtual machines may not have it. I'm trying to remember if I installed it. I don't think I did because I wanted my new students to experience installing that themselves. So go get the notes that she gave us or at least go through the recording. It was 10 minutes if I remember right. And get that spell checker installed. So this is the pointer to my input file. Remember this pointer has two purposes. It points to where the file is on disk. Gets help from Windows somehow, magic behind the scenes. And it also keeps track of what position are we in in that file, and it walks through it as we give commands to walk through that file. Okay, so there's our pointer. And then my notes say also include a class level constant to hold the file name. This is a pointer to the file, but which file am I going to open? Initially, I'm always going to open the same file. A little later in this unit, I'm going to show you the technique for ask the user, where's your file? Later. So for right now, I'm going to create a constant. Remember that goes in here. And this is going to be a string because it holds the file name and it's private. And according to my notes, it's supposed to be roster.txt. Now, I don't remember if this program probably doesn't come with one. Talk about that in a second. Okay, so there's my file name. Questions so far? All makes perfect sense. Okay, so we created, we brought in a new class, System.io, and then we created a pointer to our file. That doesn't do anything now but just point in the middle of nowhere. It has the ability to point to an input file. It's a reader. It's not a writer. It's a reader. So it has the ability to point to an input file. When you open a file for input, you must designate two things. How are you going to read it? You can read it as either binary or you can read it as text. We are always going to be using text. Reading a binary file requires a whole lot more knowledge about what those ones and zeros represent. And that's beyond the scope of this class. If you need that, you'll be taught how to figure it out and what the structure of the ones and zeros is. So we're always going to be reading text. And then where's the file? <coughs> where's the file? And how are you going to open it are all combined into one command. Now, where's the file? you can designate a complete path. What do I mean by a path? Pardon me? File tree. A file explain. It's uh, C, you know, where, where it's located completely. Where it completely, where is it located? Starting with? The drive. The drive letter, unless it's on the web. That's a whole different picture. Let's forget about that one. The drive letter. So this file is on my D drive. So I could write a program that's sitting on your H drive that reads files on the I drive that writes files to the C drive. 
In addition to the drive, you can then specify the path, the folders that you have to dig into. Desktop, Volker, Unit 1, Sample <laughs> Program, 2014, and so on. All the way down. You can specify that entire path. If you wish. Typically, I don't. Then, if I don't tell it where that is, where is it? It's in the same folder with my executable file. Whoa, wait a minute. Now we got to back up to programming logic beginning. Where's my executable file? Bin. Is this it? No, oh, somebody said bin. Very good. It's in the bin folder, debug. There's my exe file. If I don't designate a path, your program assumes it's in here. Now, there's no text file there right now, so we're going to have a problem. Luckily, we're running out of time. It doesn't matter. Right. On Thursday, we'll pick up where we left off, and I will have a sample input file. Actually, I'll show you how to create one, but I'll have <laughs> one that you can download off of OneDrive. Just remember, I told you that I bring your names in. I'm going to show you how I do that. And then we're going to read it in. We'll look at it. But if you don't designate the path, like I didn't right here in this example, if you don't designate the path, the file must be in the same folder with your executable. That same thing is going to be happening when we use our database in Unit 3. That database must be in the same folder as the executable. It doesn't have to be, but it sure complicates the issue when it is, when it isn't. Excuse me. So we're always going to put it in the same folder, and that's not a problem. Later on, when you share that masterful DVD collection program with your cousin, <laughs> you give them the exe file and the access database. As long as they're both put in the same folder, everything's cool. So if you want to open a file, we do this. In file, that's our pointer, right? File, what's that? Another class that's built into System.io. Open text is the command that says I'm opening it for text. We'll see some of the other options. Let's try it. So here's my pointer. Now I'm ready to open the file. So we'll just put a comment on here, open the file. Okay. And we need our pointer in file equals file dot and notice there's a pen, there's a pen to all, there's copy, create, delete, encrypt, and so on. We are always going to be using open. Notice there's even three or four different versions of open text. It's the only one we're going to use. And then in parentheses, the name of the file. I could type it manually, but I just created a constant, called it file name, so I'm going to use that. Now, because our time is getting short, remember I said that the last thing you do is close it. So I don't forget, I'm going to enter that command. I've forgotten it. I think it's in file dot close. <clears throat> Better double check to make sure there's nothing there I'm missing. Close the file in file name dot close. <coughs> And now, all my file processing <laughs> goes in between there. So it's like kind of like curly brackets. You've seen C sharp. You type a curly bracket, it gives you the closing curly bracket automatically. If it doesn't, I always type it first. Open, close, and then type in between. I have to do the same thing with open, close, so I don't forget. If I run this, don't. If I run this right now, what do you expect to happen when I click on open? Just Nothing. Wrong. Give an error. Why? There's no text file. There's no text file. There's no roster.txt. So I'm going to click on open, and because I didn't handle it, I'm going to get an exception. Please. Thank you. <laughs> I was afraid it was going to do nothing. <laughs> right there it says file not found exception. Well, that's not cool. That's true. It's not cool. We don't want our program to crash. 
So the other thing we're going to do when we come back on Thursday is add some logic to say, if the file is there, open it. We can ask. We can say, hey, Windows, you got one of these? You got a roster.txt right here in this folder? And if it says no, then the program comes back and we can display a message box saying, sorry, I can't find your file. So we'll add that logic as well as we go. So now yeah, we'll squeeze it in here real quick. I'll kill that program. I'm going to go into that folder. You don't have to do this. I'm just going to demonstrate that it does do something. I'm going to create a new text document called what? Roster, because that's what I said in my program it was going to be called. Now I know. Go away. I know it crashed on this. So I want to make sure all this works. So in here, I'm just going to throw in a quick message box. And actually, let me show you this. Does it still work? Oh, that's Visual Basic, sorry. Message box dot show. Made it. <coughs> Is it show? Must not be. What did I miss? Oh, message box. Now I should see that message box now because the file is there. There's nothing in it. It's okay. I didn't tell it to try to read anything from it either. I just said open it. Found it. Immediately closes it. And I made it. Whew. This is a lot of how, this is an example of how I often write code. I could write another 10 lines of code and make sure the file is there. And if it's not there, then read it one line at a time. Add that to the text box. Display it. Let's just make sure I can find it. Then we'll do next time when we start reading. Questions? Okay, again, I recommend that if you're not following now, because we haven't typed a whole lot, if you're not following now, that you maybe go home and follow along at your own pace. If not, I'll keep doing it. I'll keep saving them on OneDrive just like I did last semester, and you can just watch. But Generally, you got to do a little bit for this to sink in a little bit better. One last thing before I let you go, because I still have a minute and 20 seconds. I'm going to use every second I can here. Last week, we had in-service, or as I sometimes call it, brainwashing or indoctrination, uh, where we got some training on how the brain works for education. And there was one tip I got there that I want to share with you and recommend that you use. And that is, don't tell students the due date for an assignment. Don't just tell them the due date. In addition to that, ask. So I'm going to be asking. I haven't given you any due dates yet, but I'm warning you. <coughs> ask them, when are you going to do this? So when I give you, let's say I give you a lab, and there's only 10 minutes left in class, and I say it's due next class period, when are you going to do it? You're going to do it five minutes before class? Ben's going to tell me that, and I'm going to go, good luck with that, okay? Or, when it comes to programming, my advice is give yourself a couple of hours to get warmed up, and maybe while it's fresh, say, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, I'm going to spend an hour on this. And then on Sunday, after the game, before the game, after the game, nobody's in any shape to do programming, before the game, I'm going to do another couple of hours. And then I'll adjust from there, but at least it, it's not just a due date. Because for many of you, I know, a due date means start of the day before. If you plan it, I'm watching Matt over there with his planner writing down all kinds of good stuff. If you plan an hour tomorrow to do some programming, you'll do it. <coughs> Maybe. More likely to do it. And less likely to have that fear, angst, everything else that happens when you save it to the last minute. Many of you already do it, so this is nothing new. But for those of you who haven't picked up that skill yet, it might help you be a little more successful. Still got 20 seconds. Oh, I'll let those go. <laughs>